Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CJCA Behavioral Health Committee webinar. I'm Wendy Faulkner, Assistant Executive Director of CJCA. Today's webinar will provide an overview of the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services Behavioral Management System. I would like to thank all of you for taking time to participate in today's webinar. And special thanks to Jennifer Jaworski and Heidi Mueller from the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, who both have put a great deal of work into the preparation of this webinar, as well as our presenter for today, Robert Trillo, Assistant Commissioner of Program Services for the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services. For those of you who might be new to CJCA, we are a national nonprofit organization formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems, local secure correctional and residential facilities, services, programs, and most importantly, long-term outcomes for youth and their families. CJCA represents the juvenile justice system CEOs in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and various major metropolitan counties across the country. At this point, I'm gonna ask Darlene Conroy to provide us with a few technical instructions before we start. Darlene? Thank you, Wendy. Before starting the webinar, we wanted to review a couple of general webinar items with you. Please choose the Use Telephone feature from the audio button and calling you using the phone number and PIN number provided. Everyone on the webinar is muted. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. Please type in questions at any time in the chat box during the webinar. These will be answered during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded. A copy of the PowerPoint and link to the recording will be sent to all attendees following the webinar. Wendy? Well, at this point, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Bob to get us started. Good morning or good afternoon um, and welcome. Um, on behalf of Commissioners Forbes uh, for the Department of Youth Services, we'd like to thank CJCA uh, for allowing us this opportunity to present uh, some of our insights on behavioral management systems. Uh, today, I wanted to uh, spend some time talking about uh, implementing a developmentally responsive behavioral management system in the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services in our residential programs. Next slide, please. The goals for today's webinar is to give some insight as to the reasons prompting changes to the current behavioral management system, uh, how the new behavioral management system was implemented, elements of the new behavior management system and methods in tracking and ensuring continued quality improvement. Next slide. In 2006, our existing behavioral management system showed that we were experiencing high numbers of restraints and room confinements across our residential continuum. In drilling down into that data, we found that it was quite common that a lot of those events were the result of verbal or physical escalation by youth after losing points or privileges. In addition, often youth received room time in addition to losing points. The other common precipitant was that managing suicidal or mental health concerns where youth were having difficulty with harm, self-harm or danger to others was also being used through the behavior management system. Next slide, please. Our existing behavioral management system at the time was primarily a point system, which was not uncommon at the time for juvenile justice systems. Uh, typically in the course of the day, points were either earned or taken based on a youth compliance or engagement in daily programming. Next slide, please. At the time when we reviewed our high level of room confinement and restraints, uh, we started to have discussions about what were going to be some of our challenges in changing to a new system. At the time, the existing BMS system was based on what was considered best practice at the time. I think many folks on the phone recognize that compliance uh, was a common factor in determining youth success in programming. 
And typically the measure for program success, compliance and good behavior was generally what youth were rated on, not only on a daily basis, but also as they moved towards transitioning to the community. Another common factor was youth who questioned or challenged staff actions were often considered problematic or toxic to other youth. So youth who sometimes responded or asked to have an opportunity to respond were often seen as toxic and poor role models and sometimes were sanctioned as a result of their response. Next slide, please. At that time, there was emerging research that recommended new evidence-based and best practices approach for juvenile justice BMS practices. And some of the common themes that were presented in that research was not to re-traumatize youth with trauma histories. Based on learning new coping skills, reducing future adverse events. The practices needed to be developmentally appropriate. They needed to focus on skill development, instill hope, and achieve a positive outcome. And also another common factor that we found at the time was that it reduced the, uh, the situation of reducing separation or room confinement, which in coordination with work that was done by Lindsay Hayes at the time, which I've noted here in his original research on juvenile suicide and confinement, uh, there was a very clear association between youth exhibiting challenging behaviors, receiving isolation, separation, or room confinement, and as a result of that, escalating and creating a higher risk for suicide attempts, gestures, or situations of self-harm. Next slide, please. The department, in reviewing its uh, approach, uh, we recognized that senior leadership needed to own and be champions for change. This was one of the key ingredients, is that leadership for the agency needed to all be on board and be understood that they needed to show that leadership and be role models as we move to this new transition. A second component was the workforce needed to be heard and fully briefed on the reasons for change and how change benefited them. And also how we were going to engage our external stakeholders, providers, families, our relationships with child welfare, mental health, courts, and probation. Next slide, please. In operationalizing our new behavior management system here at the department, we had a very aggressive approach of regionally based sessions, allowing for attendance by all state and provider staff. Typically what that meant, we have a five region uh, department. We would ensure that we would have enough sessions in each region so that for residential programs, all shift staff were able to attend a session. And at that session was senior leadership, central office leadership, and individuals that would allow not only for presentation, but a quite robust uh, opportunity for staff to provide their observations and feedback. Also in that process, we did engage Lindsay Hayes to actually participate in these regional sessions provide information on the association between suicide prevention and room confinement, highly associated with behavior management system practices. And the advantage of that was it allowed the department to have an individual come and present data and research that supported the thinking of the department. The third opportunity we had was we utilized our department's clinical workforce. We have a pretty robust clinical workforce that we were able to use, not only because of their clinical skills, but because they knew our system. They were able, because there are also many of them located at the individual program sites, to not only to provide a wide range of clinical in child and adolescent expertise, but also on sites they could provide an opportunity for staff to give them support and consultation, because we knew this was going to be a significant challenge in making this change. Next slide, please. 
in our implementation discussions, we understood that there were some non-negotiables. We, at that time, agreed as a staff to eliminate our point system from our BMS platform. We also entered into discussions on revising and revamping our room confinement and residential suicide prevention policies. One of the key components in that was we delinked behavior management practices from youth that were exhibiting either suicidal or mental health concerns. Any restriction on family contact, home visit, or program extensions had to go through a rigorous review. So in the past, the point system sometimes determined if you reach certain points, would put a youth in a position at the end of the week, if they had not achieved a certain point score, may not have achieved the opportunity for home passes or home visits on the weekend. And another crucial piece which changed the dynamic between adults and youth was youth now we're going to have an opportunity to present real time feedback. So this was going to allow you at least some opportunity to present their perspective on what they were just being asked to do. Next slide, please. One of the other aspects in our operationalizing our new system was we incorporated the concepts for the behavior management system into the program handbook, which I think is consistent in most jurisdictions that programs have their own handbook, which tries to provide the youth with some understanding of that particular program, the goals of the program, the norms of the program, and also an opportunity for the youth to get a sense as to what the expectations are. We felt that that was a good venue to incorporate some of our BMS expectations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we moved from a compliance concept to a concept of our BMS expectations should be based on respect for self and others, treat others as you would expect to be treated, be helpful to others, your success is linked to their success, which forces leadership Take responsibilities for one actions, honesty and trust, and staff were expected to utilize the skill set development that they were being provided through positive youth development, motivational interviewing, and DVD tools, which I will go into greater detail later. This was a significant culture change within the department because prior to this, all actions and decisions were primarily made between program staff and the youth. And the youth was primarily a passive responder to any action that was taken through the behavior management system. Next slide, please. So there were several areas where we needed to do some very extensive work. Workforce training, which was a significant endeavor for the department. So at that point, there was a lots of consensus where we knew what we didn't want, but what was leadership going to provide as a replacement to the workforce? There was legitimate skepticism by the workforce. One of the areas that was a common theme was understanding that bias existed in all of us and that the previous behavior management system allowed for a high level of bias in making decisions around whether points were granted or taken away. So I'm going to list some of the training activities that we have done over the years. And all of these are continue to be ongoing. Uh, on the training issue, I think there's been a common theme that we have found over the years that just providing a signal training does not allow for staff to gain expertise. So all of these areas that I'm talking about, the department continues to provide refresher training. And also in some of these practices, there has been some additional research that has also refreshed the, the understanding behind these different practices. So one of the areas that we've done is uh, 
we've new, used new tools on uh, evidence-based practices, uh, positive youth development framework. We've incorporated PYD, that was in 2010. Uh, very robust training on motivational interviewing. Uh, significant training and ongoing training on adolescent brain development. I think at the time when we were having our conversations was also the time when significant knowledge was coming to place around adolescent brain development and how that impacted how youth responded and how a youth developing brain was a challenge because many times there were expectations placed on youth, and if youth did not follow those expectations, it was sometimes seems as that they were willfully refusing or not wanting to do what was being asked of them, and there was a lack of appreciation that in their own brain development that many of the responses we were seeing were normal or expected based on the developmental stage at that point in their life. Another area was recognizing the significance of trauma and how trauma interacted and how it needed to be a complementary and not an oppositional aspect to any behavior management system. We also engaged in an evidence-based practice, which again, I'll go into a little bit greater. Uh, we, used, we entered into a relationship on parenting with love and limits. Also around that time, prior the Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed, and the department was one of the initial juvenile justice systems that engaged in understanding how we would comply with those standards. And again, I'll go in a little bit longer into it, but the prior standards gave us a roadmap for also facilitating on how to embark on better behavior management system practices. We also made significant revisions to our basic training, and we also had greater inclusion of our provider vendors in that training. And over the past three years, we've embarked on a very significant uh, initiative on race and ethnicity and disparities. And these are ongoing departmental discussions which have raised issues around our hiring practices, about the department being more racially and culturally informed. Also, as an example, we're in our educational system, we're looking at many of our core subjects, for example, history. We're looking at revising and reviewing our history so that it is more culturally sensitive to our students. Now, I raise a lot of these things for the purpose that all of these are interconnected into how the department has tried to revise and revamp its behavior management system to be more engaging to youth. Another area we looked at was policy revisions. As I mentioned earlier, there was a complete revision to our room confinement, restraint, and suicide policies. We also, through the connection with our Director of Clinical Services, worked with Lindsay Hayes as a consultant to help us in ensuring that as we revised those policies, they were in keeping with the most current research and best practice. Another significant element at the time was managing by data. We were a relatively, at the time, a primitive data agency. Most of our information was confined to how many youth we had, uh, what was their offense, maybe gender, but we had very little uh, robust data sets that we could look at to assist us in making policy decisions. So one of the areas that we were able to start collecting was daily reporting on restraints and room confinement. We also would have is called in the department a nightly situation report where all of our programs report 
in a timely manner on any incidents, which most likely are connected to our behavior management system, and it allows senior management across the department to not only understand an individual incident, but to get some understanding as to some of the challenges and some of the common incidents that might be happening across the, the department. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, in the 90s, when there were significant cutbacks in the Commonwealth, which impacted the Department of Services, one of the areas that took a significant hit was quality assurance and program monitoring. So at the time of our discussions, one of the areas where we concentrated on increasing staffing and and activity was in our program monitoring process. So we revised in creating a new reporting process, and this was an on-site process at all of our state and provider programs. We also embedded in that process that when a monitoring process takes place, there is an expectation that the monitor interview at random several youth on their own experiences at the program, particularly around their treatment, safety issues, and also any concerns they may have. We've also implemented that whenever, whenever a caseworker or a representative department is at one of our residential locations, they are expected to observe and to be responsible for understanding as they're in the program, taking uh, the culture and also temperature of what they see. We also did a lot of work around youth voice and we revised our group worker advocate program. And what I want to talk about in that advocate program is that when a youth comes into one of our residential programs, one of the group workers is assigned specifically to a particular youth. So they may have a small caseload of three or four youth. And this is in all programs. That advocate is to assist the youth in what we might refer to as being their external brain. And it allows the youth an opportunity to have a safe place to discuss their observations, their concerns, and to have an adult give them feedback and an opportunity to get into a discussion about role modeling good behavior, developing relationships. Because we know that in the most current research, the most common indicator for youth success in a residential program were they able to develop positive relationships, specifically positive relationships with adults during their residential stay. The other area was incentive-based behavior management system. In moving to our new system, there were numerous incentives that were built in to support youth, not only individually, but also collectively in demonstrating over a period of time that they can achieve reasonable goals. So for example, programs would set if youth could go for X number of days without a restraint, without a room confinement, there would be an agreed upon reward determined by the youth and the staff that they would receive. Now, sometimes that could be a pizza night, Sometimes that could be a special movie, but the intent was for the youth collectively as a community to work together and to support each other. Now, our feedback on that is in many locations, although they're not always successful every month, in reviewing the group incentives, staff self-report that they find that more times than not, peers or youth 
are taking greater responsibility in redirecting you or supporting you, reducing the likelihood of either a verbal or a physical confrontation. The other area where incentives have come up is there's a greater recognition and discussion that when youth are exceeding their treatment goals, youth are requesting and youth are engaging and programs are engaging with youth, discussions about the appropriateness of transfer to the community in a shorter time period than what was usually happening in the past. Next slide, please. An important feedback was allowing the workforce to express their concerns. So hearing worker workforce feedback was an important component in us getting to where we needed to be. There were legitimate safety concerns because we were embarking a very different process where group worker staff was concerned that control was being relinquished to you. It took significant work to get to the point of where we were looking to a dynamic where youth were given greater opportunity to discuss or provide additional information in a redirection expectation from staff. So what we were working on is, as we know, group workers in the course of their day are giving numerous redirection and sometimes group workers, quite frankly, are saying, all I feel I'm doing is redirecting. So to assist them in that, we tried to get them to work towards a concept of where, when they were going to redirect, to pause, to allow for some level of processing, and also for both parties to have a chance on reflecting. And this is linked to motivational interviewing training. The second area is, was there a willingness by the agency leaders to hear how hard this is? This is not easy for leadership, who quite frankly always feels that they know what's best, to they have a willingness to listen to the voices in the workforce that still were not in agreement with the changes that were being implemented. This continues to be an ongoing process, and even to this day, there are discussions that take place periodically around dissatisfaction with some of the changes that we have made. The other area which we had to respect, which is a reality, was assuring that with our union workforce that any action we would take was sensitive to any collective bargaining agreement that was already in place. The other area that we heard was which ones and will they work? And as we implemented some of these new tools, there were some unintended consequences. So as we attempted to reduce restraints in room confinement, we found in the course of our data, data management that there was an increase in what was now being called chair time. So instead of youth being sent to their room, they were sent to the chair. As a result, of us looking at that practice, practice, that was another opportunity for us to re-engage, to relearn, to understand the dynamics behind the use of chair time and to try to work with staff and eventually get to the point where chair time was also not an accepted practice. Also, we had to be willing to listen to staff the fact that you had to get into a discussion with you, staff was still concerned about would this increase the likelihood of staff becoming more agitated or still dissatisfied with the outcome. Next slide, please. So some of the operationalizing aspects to so the group worker workforce, we reduced our program populations to 10 or 12 youth in each program. In each program, even though we may have 12 youth, we are staffed for 15. Now, the 
The Pomona Youth Services in Massachusetts, we have 45 separate programs. So you can understand implementing these practices is not easy at 45 locations. We also increased group worker FTE on the day shift. So we did increase some staff ratios. We currently have in place a pilot with our group workers for a four-day schedule. And we're still in the process of examining that four-day schedule. The expected change or outcome is in a four-day work schedule, it does increase the number of group worker staff that crosses over at the morning and afternoon shift time. So there would be a greater block of where the morning shift would interact with the second shift. The other area we looked at was program case mix. <clears throat> we separated our detained population from our committed population in a particular program. So we separated those populations into distinct programs. We minimized program functions for our committed populations. So for example, we may have, we had at that time a program that may be a treatment program, what we would call a revocation program, and maybe an assessment program. And we tried to reduce our program so they didn't have any more than two levels of care that they had to work with. <clears throat> We also increased our residential continuum. So we went from primarily a hardware staff secure department to force the care, individual apartments, transitional independent living programs. This allowed for youth to have greater opportunity while, if they began their placement in a hardware or staff secure to look forward to entering into placements that were more community-based. We also revised and enhanced our basic training for new staff. We incorporated what we call defensive disengagement training. So in our, we continue to have to respond where restraints take place, our room confinement takes place. Um, our defensive disengagement training allows for staff to take defensive actions, which reduces the likelihood of injury to both youth and staff, and also reduces the likelihood of the length or the time of an event that may take place. We also, at that time, where we have provider and state programs that are co-located, co we have an expectation that there was one restraint practice that is being used. We also increased our regional clinical supervisory staff. We, at that point, added some senior supervisory clinical staff to each region to support the clinical uh, bench in each region. We also revised our on-call system so that, essentially, programs can reach out 24-7 to get consultation services from either clinical or administrative staff for either prior to an event or to discuss a potential event or post-event. We also embarked on increasing our supervisor training opportunities to both state and provider staff, which, which involve both internal and external opportunities for skill development. We also created a new position to our Director of Victim Services to staff support services. And that individual provides confidential support, information, and referral. And at this particular point, staff are very comfortable calling that person even though they are a central office employee. Next slide, please. So some of the areas that impacted, which resulted in our new behavioral management system was a recognition that much of our programming was not robust enough and not engaging enough for the population we serve. So we restructured our educational programming. We included more career readiness and allowing youth to discuss what their career aspirations were. We also created some on-site employment experiences 
uh, where youth actually earn minimum wage. We have greenhouses, culinary, woodworking, and silk screening shops. shops. These are all programs that are for the purposes of adding engagement opportunities for youth. We try to ensure that these programs are available to all youth that are in the program, that it is not a selective process. We also provide secondary and on-site and online opportunities. So this allows youth who have achieved their attainment an opportunity to participate in post-secondary programming. We also increase visual and performing artist in residence programming. This was significant. We were probably our seventh or eighth year into that. This is a program that allows you to have an opportunity through visual and performing arts to express and to learn and also to understand some of their own talents and we find that the artist in residence program, as we've moved along, we now are connecting it more to our clinical programming. And we do have a particular artist in residence program, which specifically is designed to work with trauma and trauma in uh, youth who've had significant histories of trauma. We increased our health and wellness programming to ensure that we work with uh, developmentally appropriate topics. And we've incorporated in several of our regions yoga, uh, which is connected to DBT mindfulness skill development. Recreation, which we know is significant for youth in the course of the day in a residential program. We created new positions for uh, physical educational staff, and we have an expectation that youth receive daily phys ed, which again we believe reduces frustration and allows youth to take a time out in just being programmed all day. And also we have found in many of our locations that staff have expanded the range of recreational activities to be greater than just basketball and football. And we have found in some cases, many programs, staff and youth are working together on what they call sports tournaments. We also increased our opportunity for volunteering opportunities, not only as programs collectively or allowing individuals. So this allows youth to have opportunities to be outside of the program to give back to the community. Next slide, please. Clinical staff are a crucial resource when it comes to implementing and understanding a behavior management system. So in our, in using our clinical workforce, uh, we want to make sure that we created a trauma responsive environment. We did a sleep study initiative. We also, as I mentioned earlier, we use the Prison Rape and Elimination Act, uh, which has very prescriptive standards. We developed a new policy called an individual support plan policy. We wanted to make sure that there's trauma training for all staff. We revised our assessment practices for new commits. So there's greater upfront risk assessment when new commits come into our program. And I've listed here some of the tools that we're using. We do look at someone ACES score. Uh, we do the, the YLSI and we also do the Maisie. And also I want to mention that we have expanded our placement options for transgender youth so that youth self, who self-identify as transgender are able to be placed in the location where they've identified as their gender. And also the department takes the responsibility of ensuring not only clothing, but also that all staff refer to that youth by the name that they've chosen. Now, these are all activities that are intended to reduce the potential dysregulation of youth when they come into a residential environment where we try to, as much as possible, accommodate and ensure the youth that safety and that 
respecting them as young adults is a prime concern. Uh, next slide, please. Positive youth development was a significant platform in developing our behavior management system. So we know that PYD is an intentional pro-social approach that engages youth in a manner that is productive and constructive. So as I mentioned earlier, what is the expected outcomes of PYD? To move from a deficit to a strength-based strength model, empowering youth to take more control of their life decisions. Group workers were skilled as mentors and advocates and key players in youth success, enhancing, enhancing each youth skill set in all life domains, and providing continuity of message across the department's residential continuum, having a single playbook. This is a key component. When we created our new behavior management system, we created common guidelines and expectations so that as youth move through our continuum, they didn't have to learn a new behavior management practice so that it allows youth as they move through our continuum to have a consistent message throughout their transition time. Next slide, please. We engaged parenting love and limits as a complementary aspect to our behavior management system because PLL actually is an intensive youth and parent treatment intervention which takes place during a youth residential stay. The significant component of PLL is providing youth and parents a new communication strategy, reducing conflict, forces mutual understanding, and I want to stress this, empowers parents' role in decision-making and setting limits. One of the significant things that we found as a common issue is that parents felt disempowered, and also when a youth comes into state care, there's significant stigma, stigma and shame in them feeling that they have lost the capacity to parent their own child. So this is a key piece in assisting parents and fostering and supporting them and taking greater at role in the decision making in their parental responsibilities. Next slide, please. Youth and family voice. One of the areas that we felt was significant was that, that youth were seen but not heard. A significant change was that youth and family have the right to be heard, provide input into the youth care, and to comment on what's working and not working, and provide suggestions and opportunities for improvement. We increased visiting times and family events at the program. This was to reduce the institutional nature of our settings. We created a new family engagement policy. We also started to include youth and family members in departmental forums and meetings. And we also included youth voice at our basic training for new staff. Next slide, please. DBT, I think there have been numerous discussions that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has embarked on using DBT as a platform, specifically also in working towards our behavior management system. So that several years ago, our Director of Clinical Services, through an agreement with Marsha Linehan, developed a modified BD, DBT manual for adolescents. And DYS was one of the first entities to use DBT for incorporation into our behavior management system. And DBT provides youth with new skills for managing painful emotions and decreasing conflict, conflict in relationships. So a common theme in developing our behavior management system is DBT, motivational interviewing, and PYD are all complementary platforms. So we were ensuring that any new evidence-based practice we, we used, that they were complementary to DBT. There is an expectation that all clinical staff are DBT certified. All DBT, all youth receive DBT skill building sessions during the course of their residential placement. And we've expanded the number of staff 
that is expected to be trained and participate in DBT sessions for you. Next slide, please. Motivational interviewing. Um, I'm quite an advocate for motivational interviewing, and the reason motivational interviewing was a key component in implementing our new behavior management system is that motivational interviewing, which is a primarily a staff skill building exercise, the main component of motivational interviewing is the teachers, group workers, new communication skills that teaches them a language that allows them to have greater strategies and tools for reducing interactions that have the potential to escalate to aggressive or assaultive practices. We've also over time learned that when we open up a new program or if there's a program that's struggling with room confinement or restraint events, that we will enhance or do refreshers of motivational interviewing sessions. Next slide, please. Another significant change with the department, which, which was specifically for the purposes of allowing youth to focus while they're in residential, when I leave residential, what's going to be out there for me? What's going to be my support network? So the department through regulatory and statutory change, we develop what's called our youth engaging in services. So our YES program is an opt-out program. Every committed youth is engaged on whether they wish post-discharge to enter into a voluntary relationship with the department where we are able to work with them up through the age of 22. Now the advantage of the YES program is that when youth are newly committed, as they work through their residential placement, this is an incentive for youth as they're discharging because components of the YES program can provide housing, educational resources, health services, and continued case management connections. So I just refer, if, if people are looking for additional information on the department's use of post-discharge services, uh, in a most recently published JJ Leadership Network publication, a roadmap to the ideal JJ system, which May 2019, there is a section which gives greater detail about our YES program. But I mentioned it for the purposes in this conversation that it's extremely important that as youth who are in residential or who are looking at maybe months or years of placement, of having an opportunity to have some hope and also to get some understanding of what might be available in the future. Next slide, please. Now, on monitoring and tracking, which is a significant component in ensuring that whatever we implemented, we were able to understand if it was working and working properly, we developed numerous departmental work groups. So there were, were workforce improvements, as I mentioned earlier, around reducing program size, increased staff ratios, increasing staff opportunities for skill building. We also, a creation of a safety task force, which was both an internal and external uh, group that meets on a regular basis, which has program group worker representatives with senior staff where dialogues continue to take place so that there is continued feedback on a range of activities in our residential programming. And our on, ongoing work groups allow for both our state and provider workforces to remain engaged in keeping those lines of communication opening. We also embarked on a new case management system, which allowed us to start collecting data and having some capacity 
to look at population trends, uh, different metrics, so that we could have a better sense through managing by data whether some of these aspects that we were implementing, were they having the designed outcome. We also were very clear when we made these changes that staff would not be sanctioned for acting in good faith in implementing new policies. So we were very clear that unless there was gross negligence, we did not want staff to be in a position of where these new practices were automatically going to be seen as jeopardizing their employment status. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we expanded data collection, our new case management system, policy revisions, which were more developmentally appropriate, less correctional, and allow for greater on-site decision-making. As we all know, we probably all work in systems that are very policy-driven. It has been a very challenging aspect for us to allow a certain level of gray in our policy. At times, it makes staff very unsettled because they want to know clearly what they should or should not do. So this is still an ongoing conversation that takes place in the department, but we feel it's very important that the adults on site have the capacity to make the best decision at the time with the situation they're facing. We also increased opportunities for greater community access while in residential placement. Prior practice was if youth went to a program for six months, the only time they probably left the program was either a group with the program or for home visits. Now we are working towards greater flexibility during residential placement for greater access either in local or home community activities. Next slide, please. A significant change for us was opening the doors at residential programs. And I want to mention this because we increased the opportunities for family members to be on site, provide their feedback, and also, if a youth is having a difficult day, parents may be contacted at the time to be allowed to have a conversation with their child. We also, as a department, now participate in more departmental activities on our location sites. So when we have senior staff at departmental meetings or even other interagency meetings, we ensure that we now have those activities take place at our programs. And one of the reasons for that is, is it allows for youth to also have greater contact with senior decision makers. But there's also an expectation that at these visits, we periodically walk through the program. We want to make sure a scheduled program happening. Are all youth involved? There's pre-conversations with youth and staff to gauge their experiences. We also, at that time, take a look at the environmental conditions. What's the state of the program? Food service, classroom space, conditions of the living space. It allows us to take a read and also allows youth and staff to give access to senior leadership. Next slide, please. Procurement practices. So briefly, I just want to talk about that in our procurement practices, we included our BMS guidelines. So what you have listed here is there's an expectation on the DBT, PYD, and restraint and room confinement. They must be based on fairness and strength-based. Handbooks are reviewed during the procurement process, and awarded providers must produce monthly reports and monitors review progress and opportunities for improvement. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned in our monitoring, these are some of the reports, a nightly report, restraints, assaults, and room confinement, a daily education student profile report. We have serious incident reports, population reports, monthly monitoring reports, and monthly monitoring reports on several metrics of our population. These are all reports that are seen by not only senior staff, but program staff. So at, at this point, 
I know we don't have much time, but uh, if we go to the next slide, I have provided some contact information, and I've provided people with my, e my email address, and people are more than welcome to um, contact me if they wish additional information or would like to speak to some of the individuals here in the department who are responsible for some of these areas. So I, I thank you for uh, taking this time to hear about the Commonwealth uh, Behavior Management System. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that really excellent uh, presentation, Mr. Trillo. This is Heidi Miller. I'm the chair of the uh, Behavioral Health Committee um, and, and jumped on just a few minutes after you started because I was running around today. <laughs> um, but I, I, there are just a few questions that we have just a few minutes. Um, okay. And a couple folks had typed in questions. So I'm just going to, if you don't mind, uh, relay the questions to you that people had. And hopefully we could get a couple answers. And then I know you posted contact info for people to follow up with you if they want to. Um, the first question I have is, whether there's a place that folks can go to review your new BMS protocols and procedures, um, if there's any pu like public place where people can get access to those documents? Um, certainly we can. Uh, interesting enough, uh, the answer is yes, but it would be uh, having people, ha uh, we would direct them towards specific policies that we've changed. Uh, like our family engagement policy, our individual mm -hmm. support plan. So the answer is yes. And also we have, uh, I have in front of me uh, a DYS specific positive youth development guidebook. So okay. the answer is yes, we can, we can provide a range and also some examples of program handbooks. So people should, people should people contact you via email yeah. to get this? Okay. Yeah, that would be the easiest. And, and, and again, we, we would be more than willing to, uh, reach out to them individually and to be however we could be help, of help. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is a pretty easy one. Is the management system that used in both secure and non-secure facilities? Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> and then the next question, uh, are group workers, the group workers you re referenced, are those your frontline custody staff? That's correct. All right. And then one more, uh, how often do residential programs allow parent family visitation? Is it daily, multiple times a week? There are weekly expectations, but we continue to move towards a more open door practice so that if family would like to come and visit their son or daughter that day, we're trying to move door towards accommodating some real-time flexibility, which would be similar to what parents are able to do in the public school system. Okay. And we have, thank you, we have just one more here. Um, are there any longitudinal studies that you're aware of that examine whether changes in residential behavior management systems translate to reductions in recidivism upon return to the community and or increases in positive slash pro-social behaviors? Well, it's interesting. I, I would, again, refer people back to that uh, publication that just came out. Um, yeah. I would also um, refer people to, you know, some of the work that, you know, uh, BJCA has done. I would, I would say if people, if whoever had, if folks or a person has that question, I, what we can do is we can uh, provide them with some of the research and literature that we've used that's guided us in, in making these changes. And I just want to say our original uh, BS program, initial feedback is that youth who engage in our YES program, which is around 50% of our discharge population, that in the first 60 to 90 days, the recidivism rate is lower than those youth who have not engaged in post-discharge uh, relationships. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're right up at our time limit here, but I, I just want to 
reiterate our thanks for this really, really informative presentation. Um, this is really, really helpful, and I imagine that a lot of us will be reaching out to you for some additional documents, policies, and procedures, and to pick your brain a little bit further. So we really, really appreciate it. Well, again, the Mass Massachusetts appreciates the opportunity uh, to share what it's learned and also to share our challenges and where areas we still need to learn. Great. Well, well thank there. you, everyone. <laughs> thank thank you. you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.